Before we start, I wanted to tell you about New Scientist's Summer Sale. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 50% off an annual subscription to New Scientist. That's either web-only access or subscription bundles that include our app and print magazine too, all half price. A subscription to New Scientist lets you read every single one of our articles. That's all our news coverage, our in-depth features, plus our comment and culture pieces and much more. To get 50% off a year's worth of access, visit newscientist.com forward slash pod 50. Hello and welcome to New Scientist Weekly. I'm Penny Sarche. And I'm Emily Bates. Welcome to the show. This week, we're joined by New Scientist reporters Michael LePage, Jason Murugesu and Alex Wilkins. Together, we'll be talking about China's imminent space launch. We'll be hearing about a black hole symphony. And there's news about the impacts of catching COVID-19 during pregnancy. We'll also be learning about how competition for pollinators could have some surprising effects on plant biodiversity. But let's start by discussing the extreme heat waves currently underway in the Northern Hemisphere. Yes, so there have been many heat waves in the Northern Hemisphere this year so far, from India and Japan through to China and the US. And of course, this week, the UK experienced particularly extreme heat. The temperature exceeded 40 degrees Celsius, that's 104 Fahrenheit, for the first time in the UK. We also had uh, the country's hottest ever night. So Michael, why has it been so hot? Well, uh, the the immediate reason for the UK heat wave is that continental Europe has also been really hot and all that hot air from Spain and France has then flowed northwards over the UK. But of course, standing back, the bigger reason is global heating. As the planet gets hotter, the extremes get a lot more extreme. And here in England, we've had red alerts and were advised not to travel. And some said that this was overreacting, that other parts of the world cope fine with 40 degrees. What would you say to that? Well, I think a lot fewer are saying that now we've seen just how serious this kind of heat is. But in the UK, there are two issues. And the first is that many people are not used to this kind of heat, both in terms of being physically acclimatised to it, but also just knowing how to keep cool. So, for instance, I saw and heard many houses that had the windows wide open during the hottest part of the day. And if it's hotter outside than in, you're just letting the heat in. The other issue is that our infrastructure is not designed to cope. So in the UK... Very few homes have air conditioning and houses are built to keep the heat in. So they get hot during the day and then they stay hot during the night. I can tell you the walls of my house are still radiating heat even as we speak, even though it's cooled down outside. And the thing about that is that hot nights don't just make sleeping hard, as we've, we've all found recently. They also don't give the body a chance to recover from the heat. And that can lead to serious heat stress, especially in the vulnerable. Mm, I I have to say, I've been surprised that even though now it's cooled down a bit, how slowly my home has been losing its heat. It's still so warm. And I also heard that even places that have air conditioning, some of these experience breakdowns on the hottest days. Yes, of course, so many shops and offices in the UK do have cooling systems, but they weren't designed to cope with 40 degrees Celsius. No one sort of imagined that was going to happen. And of course, it's not just buildings. We've also seen massive transport disruption because of roads, railways and runways melting and warping and so on. Right. So clearly we need to upgrade our infrastructure somehow. So what sort of things are we going to need to do? Well, there are some relatively cheap and simple things that can keep houses cooler. So one key thing is to stop that summer sunshine getting into your windows. That, That makes a big difference. And that can be done by having outside shutters or awnings or even just planting trees in the right place to provide shade. But a lot of buildings are actually pretty hard to upgrade. Uh, So in particular, glass skyscrapers are already a disaster in climate terms. You know, they need a huge amount of energy to cool in the summer. And they also need a huge amount of energy to heat in winter. So we really just need to stop building them. And of course, we need to redouble our efforts to cut emissions and and stop the world getting progressively hotter and hotter and hotter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what we've seen is actually really frightening, frankly. Not even climate scientists thought we'd see the UK hit 40 degrees so soon or see extreme heat leading to fires breaking out all over the country and houses being burned down. And as you said, this isn't a UK-specific problem, of course. No, things like this have been happening all across the Northern Hemisphere this year. The US has experiencing extreme heat again in in many places. There are reports of more than 1,000 people dying of the recent heat wave in Spain and Portugal. We've had wildfires all over Europe. And it's not just heat. There's also serious drought in many places. In the EU, hydropower generation is down by a third. Low river levels are reducing barge deliveries to Germany. 
And we've also got the heat and drought affecting crop yields, which is going to make the global food crisis even worse. So these heat waves, they're not just a bit of summer warmth. They're a really serious problem with many major consequences. And if these crazy extremes can happen with just 1.5 degrees or less than 1.5 degrees of global warming so far, just imagine what it's going to be like with 2 degrees or 3 degrees. That's what we're heading for, so we've really got to up our game. Right, we'll give our minds a bit of a break from the heat for now and instead turn to space. Alex, what has China been getting up to recently? So on Sunday, China's going to be launching the second part of their space station. It's a little bit similar to the ISS, the US-led International Space Station, which you probably heard of. It's been on the news for decades. But China's going to be trying to do their own thing, really. So they launched the first core section of their space module last year, and they sent three astronauts up. They're all living fine, doing experiments, but it's, it's currently unfinished. They've still got two modules to add. Once Wentian, the next bit, launches on Sunday, they're going to send up a third module in October, and then the space station will be fully operational. So what are the goals of China's space station? And is there anything particularly special about this second module that's going up? So in the past, China's sort of been locked out of collaborating on certain space missions, mainly by the US. And so they really sort of turned inward and focused on their own domestic space policy. They've been pretty successful. Just in the last few years, they've launched rovers to Mars. They've sent a rover to the far side of the moon. And they're going to have built a space station that's going to be a core to the size of the ISS. This latest module in particular is going to be the first module that can actually do science. It's a laboratory module. So this is when the the full sort of scientific mission of the space station can really start. Mm, so science is one of the main goals here then? Yeah, it's it's definitely really well equipped to carry out a lot of experiments, mainly life sciences, but it's got loads of other functions as well, sort of aside from science. It's got additional crew quarters, so the station can now accommodate six astronauts in total. And then it's got loads of tools that will help the station function as a whole, like solar panels, a robotic arm, and also an airlock for future docking missions or spacewalks. And then it's also got a bunch of additional tools that the core module already has in case they fail. So a bit of redundancy in there as well. So lots going on. Um, state space programs are often thought of as, as being you know, quite slow and delayed and, and hard to sort of get going. So it's quite something to think that uh, not only are they going to be doing this launch on Sunday, there's a third module that's going to be launching in just a few months time. Yeah, they, they've really been going full steam ahead. China set the record last year for the most space launches from any country and they're probably going to do it again this year, according to the experts that I spoke to. They've quietly launched a bunch of really impressive missions over the past couple of years, and even seasoned observers of China's space activity are actually quite surprised at how successful they've been. So is this space station going to be as collaborative as the International Space Station? You know, the ISS always seemed to involve lots of countries and be a real team effort. So it's probably not going to be quite as collaborative as the ISS, but China seems open to at least some international involvement. The US let individual country space programs send up and manage their own experiments, whereas for the Chinese space station, it'll probably be managed and overseen by the Chinese space agency. But there's an interesting point here in that countries that have been historically blocked out of collaborating with the US mission, like Iran, North Korea, sort of pariah states on the international stage, might actually be allowed to have experiments on China's space station. It's None of it's too confirmed yet. Right. So aside from the science, it's being used as a bit of a political tool as well. Yeah, exactly. And what's more, the USS-led ISS is actually due to be decommissioned in the next few years, probably towards the end of the decade. So perhaps China actually sees this as an opportunity to become the only game in town when it comes to space experiments. Thanks, Alex. I'll be interested to hear how that launch goes on Sunday. And now some messages from our sponsors. People age at different speeds and the date on your birth certificate may not represent your inner biological age at all. If you're looking for ways to extend your health span and slow down the ageing process, the keys to health and longevity may run in your blood. That's why Inside Tracker provides you with a personalised plan to improve your metabolism, reduce stress, improve sleep and optimise your health for the long haul. Inside Tracker analyses your blood, DNA and fitness tracking data to identify where you're optimised and where you're not. You'll get a daily action plan with personalised guidance on the right exercise, nutrition and supplementation for your body. For a limited time, get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash new scientist. That's insidetracker.com forward slash new scientist. How do we hear? What parts of our brain respond to sound? And how does the brain make sense of what we hear? 
How We're Wired is a new neuroscience podcast from the Bertarelli Foundation. And in the latest episode, you can join evolutionary anthropologist, Dr. Anna Mayton on a sensory journey exploring the world of sound and how we hear it. You'll meet a dancer who remembers being able to hear clearly for the very first time. You'll learn how our brains break down complex sound in a noisy environment, and you'll experience a device which expands the pleasure we get from music. The podcast is How We're Wired from the Bertarelli Foundation. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Now it's time for a musical interlude. Um, Well, a musical and cosmic interlude, actually. It's the Black Hole Symphony. And to tell us about that, over to Rowan and sub-editor Beth Ackerley. So um, here's a thought experiment for you. If I were to ask you what a black hole sounds like, what would you imagine? (laughs) What a black hole sounds like? Um, I would imagine billions of tons of matter being crushed into an accretion disk. (laughs) Oh, no. Are you tricking me because um, we're in space and and no one can hear you scream in space? (laughs) Quite well, yeah. So it's hard for us to kind of imagine what various space phenomena sound like because... Obviously, sound waves need to travel through a medium and and space is a a near perfect vacuum in which there are very few particles that can allow that to happen. So it's it's very rare that sound waves are able to travel and and let alone that we can take those sound waves and then convert them into the range of human hearing. Yeah. So how can we or can we even ever hear space? (laughs) Well, well, one way of, of sort of hearing space is to take astronomical data. So things like the brightness or, or the position of a star, say, right. uh, and you translate that into an aspect of sound, whether that's pitch, rhythm, tempo, whatever. And that process is known as data sonification. And it's frequently used by, by scientists at NASA and elsewhere to represent their findings in an accessible way. But some artists and musicians are taking that one step further and they're, and they're building whole pieces of music around data sonification. Yeah, and that's what we we did this in um, our sister pod, uh, Escape Pod, didn't we? Um, right. I'll dig that out and put a link in the show notes. So what, what's the new thing here, though, Beth? So um, I want to talk about a particular show, which is called Black Hole Symphony. So it's a, it's a multimedia orchestral concert. Is it a tragedy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. But um, it, so it's being held at the Museum of Science in, in Boston, in Massachusetts. Um, and it's incorporated all this cutting edge research on black holes. And it's translated that into a five movement electro symphonic score. So it combines kind of narration that explains the science of black holes and their surrounding phenomena with these kind of immersive planetarium style visuals that are they're based on um, images taken by scientific instruments. So things like the Event Horizon Telescope and all of these elements, they combine and they take you on a journey through the features of a black hole. So things like the torus of dust that surrounds it and these beams of ionized matter called relativistic jets that it emits. <laughs> Cool. And they've made us um, some clips, haven't they, to listen to? Yeah. So um, uh, these clips are from uh, David Ibbett, um, who's the composer of the piece and and the entire Black Hole Symphony team. So this first one is is from the very start of the symphony. And it it gives us this far out view of a a cosmos that's littered with black holes. And as you listen, you'll, you'll hear the piccolo at the start. And the melody of that is drawn from a sonification of the electromagnetic emissions of a galaxy with an active galactic nucleus, which is... It's a compact region at the centre of the galaxy that kind of emits a lot of energy. The X-ray sky. Each dot is not a star, but a black hole. Nested at the heart of every galaxy, they are the conductors of a cosmic symphony. And that is amazing to... (laughs) to listen to knowing what you just said about it being sonification of the emissions of a galaxy. Yes, Amazing. it's incredible. Like just how, how it's all been brought together is just, it sounds so beautiful. Wow. Um, and what's the second clip? So the second clip is called uh, Dance of the Merging Black Holes. And it's based on a simulation of two black holes merging um, that was created by Fabio Pacucci at Harvard University. In the background of this, you'll, you'll be able to hear a sort of long fluctuating kind of drone and this is where um, here the stretching and squeezing of space time by gravitational waves that pattern is being used to dictate the sliding notes of a trombone which is just mad I think it's fantastic (laughs) 
amazing. Where can we go if we want to hear this and see these performances? Um, so the show is going to be taking place at the Museum of Science in Boston um, on the 28th of July and the 25th of August. Sadly, um, no performances outside the US have been announced as yet, but um, I've got my fingers crossed that it will be touring elsewhere <laughs> soon. Next, we have news about how COVID-19 increases the risk of premature birth. Penny? Yeah, so last week we were talking about all the evidence so far that COVID-19 infections can impair sperm count and quality, at least in the short term and maybe longer term for a few people. And now this week, there's a new study that's found that the risk of giving birth prematurely is sevenfold higher if you catch COVID-19 in the last six weeks or so of pregnancy. Right, that sounds like a lot. So how did they find that out? Well, it builds on previous findings that suggested that COVID carries a higher risk of preterm birth. I do actually remember that even in the first few months of the pandemic back in 2020, there were signs that this could be the case. Mm. So now a team in Israel has had a look at how the timing of when you catch COVID can affect the risk of preterm birth. They tracked what happened in nearly 3,000 cases of COVID-19 infection during pregnancy, and they found that there was no significant rise in risk of premature birth, that is, giving birth before 37 weeks of pregnancy, if the infection occurred during the first six months. But if the infection was in the last three months of pregnancy, the incidence of premature birth rose from 2.3% to 5.8%. And this went up to 9.1% in people who caught COVID-19 at week 34 or later. Wow, that's really quite a jump, isn't it? So nearly one in 10 who were infected at week 34 or later went on to have a baby early in the next few weeks. Yeah, and for comparison, when they looked at pregnancies that had no COVID infections, the overall incidence of preterm birth was was just 1.4%. So the team behind the work suggests that you should practice social distancing and respiratory protection after 34 weeks of pregnancy. Essentially, that's seeing few people, wearing masks, all of those measures we're familiar with. Although the data did show quite a jump in preterm birth if you catch COVID any time in the third trimester. And what about other adverse events like miscarriage, for example? This study didn't find a link between COVID-19 infection and miscarriage or stillbirth or with babies being born small for their age. But maybe it's worth noting that a small study last month did find that COVID-19 during pregnancy was linked to delays in babies reaching developmental milestones later on, although the overall incidence of that was still quite small. Of course, pregnancy is a worrying time for a lot of people anyway. Is this just going to add to that? Because we're all having to learn to live with COVID now, for me, quite a big part of that is understanding the particular risk for certain groups in various conditions. It's not going to be a one size fits all. So I think it's really important to learn, for example, that masks and social distancing are particularly key in the final trimester of pregnancy. So ultimately, I I do hope that rather than just adding to worry, uh, studies like this can help inform public health measures. Um, So for example, last week, it was announced that pregnant people in the UK will be eligible for a COVID vaccine booster this autumn and I wonder if in future as we begin to understand this even more something like this might be offered as standard during those last three months of pregnancy. Last up we have a story looking at some unexpected effects declining insect populations could have on plant diversity. Jason, we know that crashes in insect numbers are a major issue. Insects are a vital food source for many animals and important pollinators too. That's right. Um, And this week I reported on a study that looked at how declining pollinator populations, things like bees and butterflies, may shape plant communities. Okay, so we know that a lot of plants need pollinators to reproduce, but I'm not sure that I've thought much before about how a scarcity of pollinators could shift the balance of which types of plants live together and and which plants are dominant. Is that what this study looked at? Yeah, so um, Chris Johnson at the University of Washington in Seattle and his colleagues wanted to find out essentially how competing for pollinators can affect which species of plant are able to coexist with each other. So what did they study to do that? They made an, they made an artificial meadow essentially. They set up 82.25 metre squared patches of land in a meadow in Switzerland. They focused on five particular species including poppies, cornflowers and wild fennel. They're all annual plants so they have a short lifespan and so the study could be completed within a year. The way they did it was In each plot of land, they planted two of each species. Half of them were able to be pollinated by insects naturally, and so were the other half. But in addition to the natural pollination, 
They were also given hand pollination, which is basically a group of ecologists for about three months would use a paintbrush to transfer pollen manually from one plant to another and just give them extra pollination. So um, just understanding the experiment then, you might have, uh, say, two poppy plants in one of the plots and one of them gets a hand being pollinated and the other one has to just hope that an insect comes to visit it. But what about what else was growing in that plot? Yeah, so in addition to those 10 plants, there was also a background species, which was one of the same species, i.e. a poppy or fennel. And these background species were grown at varying densities among the 80 plots. The idea was, can a poppy compete for a pollinator's attention if it's growing among a high density of fennel? And so what did they find? The study showed that the plants that weren't hand-pollinated weren't as able as the ones that were to compete with the background plants and successfully produce seeds. Okay, so the hand-pollinated plants were like a control. They showed that with sufficient attention, these plants could compete with background plants and reproduce. Yes, exactly. But if a plant had to rely on attention from pollinators, they were less able to compete against the plot's dominant flora. The team suggests that their findings mean that increasing competition for pollinators will lead to fewer plants being able to coexist with each other, which means less plant diversity in a given space. So it's really interesting. Why is it so hard for a lone flower then to compete for attention among a patch of of other plants, you know, another species that's that's at much higher density? Yeah, um, it's unclear for now, but it could be that when pollinators are scarce, those that are around end up favouring certain plants more. You know, perhaps the more attractive ones, the more common ones, and this is to the detriment of less common species. To me, what this shows is that falling insect populations are going to have major effects on plant life that we simply haven't imagined yet. And that's it for this week. Thanks to our guests, Michael LePage, Alex Wilkins, Beth Anakali and Jason Muragesu. And thanks to you for listening. Next week, we'll be airing a special episode of New Scientist Weekly featuring the highlights of our live recording at the Blue Dot Festival at Jodrell Bank. So if you're at the festival this weekend, do go along to the note stage where Rowan and New Scientist resident astronomer Abby Beale will be recording our podcast live with a panel of guests. That's taking place at 4pm on Saturday, 23rd of July. We'll put a link in our show notes with the details, but if you can't make it, you'll hear all the highlights in next week's episode. I can't wait for that. In the meantime, don't forget you can get a half price New Scientist subscription by visiting newscientist.com slash pod 50. And do remember to rate and subscribe to our podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Penny Sarche. And I'm Emily Bates. Goodbye. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk. 